It's a beautiful, beautiful day out. In fact, looking at the weather, we might go to the pool that we have in the back and might do some playing around with it there. We need to do some testing of the chemicals and such in it first, but it should be kind of fun. It should be exciting to be able to go back there and play on this very warm day. There's a lot of birds out there. Anyway, um, some of the scenes or some of the things that you do at the we do at the pool can be seen on Monica's projects, but it's not not necessarily kid friendly. Uh, anyway. What we've got here is we've got Borrowers of Field. This today is we are on chapter nine. So if you guys would grab your copies of the books if you have it. If you don't, it's a pretty good one to read along with and to read to your kids to try and enhance their imaginations if you haven't figured out. And let's go ahead and follow along if you guys would like, share, and subscribe. <clears throat> now today said Pod at breakfast next morning. We'd better go gleaning. There's a harvested cornfield yonder. Nuts and fruits is all right, he went on. But for winter, we're going to need bread. Winter? moaned Homily. Aren't we supposed to be looking for the badger set? And she went on, who's going to grind the corn? You and Arietti, couldn't you? said Pod. Between stones... You'll be asking us to make fire with two sticks next, grumbled Homily. And how do you think I can make bread without an oven? And what about yeast? Now, if you ask me, she went on, we don't want to go gleaning and trying to make bread and all that nonsense. What we want to do is put a couple of nuts in our pockets, pick what fruit we see on the way, and have a real good look for the badger set. As you say, agreed Pod after a moment, and heaved aside. They tidied away breakfast, put the more precious of their belongings inside the boot, and carefully laced it up, and struck out uphill beyond the water, along the hedge which lay at right angles to the bank in which they had passed the night. It was a weary traipse. Their only adventure was at midday when they rested after a frugal luncheon of rain-sodden, overripe blackberries. Homily, laying back against the bank, her drowsy eyes fixed on the space between a stone and a log, saw the ground begin to move. It streamed past the gap in a limited but constant flow. Oh my goodness, Pod. She breathed after watching a moment to make sure it was not an optical illusion. D do you see what I see there by that log? Pod, following the direction of her eyes, did not speak straight away. And when he did, it was hardly above a whisper. Yes, he said, seeming to hesitate. It's a snake. Oh my goodness, breathed Homily again in a trembling voice and Arietti's heart began to beat wildly. Don't move, whispered Pod, his eyes on the steady ripple. There seemed to be no end. The snake went on and on and on. But just when they felt they could bear the sight not a moment longer, they saw the flick of its tail. They all breathed again. What was it, Pod? asked Homily weakly. An adder? A grass snake, I think, said Pod. Oh, oh, exclaimed Arietti with a relieved little laugh. They're harmless. Pod looked at her gravely. His current burnished face seemed more doughy than usual. To humans, he said slowly. And what's more, he added, you can't talk to snakes. Pity, remarked Homily, that we did not bring one of the hat pins. What good would that have done? asked Pod. By about tea time, they found, to their surprise, 
that they were more than halfway along the third side of the field. There had been more walking than searching. None of the ground they had covered so far could have housed the Hendries, let alone a badger colony. The bank, as they made their way uphill beside the hedge, had become lower in proportion until, here, where they sat drearily munching rose hips, there was no bank at all. It's almost as far now, said Pod, to go back the same way as we came, as to keep on round. What do you say, Homily? We better keep on round, then, said Homily hoarsely. A hairy seed of a rose hip being stuck in her throat, she began to cough. I thought you said you cleaned them. She complained to Arietti when she could get back her breath. I must have missed one, said Arietti. So sorry. And she passed her mom a new half hip, freshly scored. She had rather enjoyed opening the pale scarlet globes and scoping out the golden nest of close-packed seeds. And she liked the flavor of the hips themselves. They tasted, as she thought, of apple skins honeyed over with a dash of a rose petal. Well then, said Pod standing up, we better start moving. The sun was setting when they reached the fourth and last side of the field. But the hedge drew out a ragged carpet of shadow. Through a gap in the dark branches, they could see a blaze of golden light on a sea of harvested stubble. As we're here, suggested Pod, standing still and staring through the gap. And it's pretty well downhill most of the way back now. What's the harm in an ear or two of corn? None, said Homily wearily. If it would walk out and follow us. Corn ain't heavy, said Pod. Wouldn't take us no time to pick a few ears. Homily sighed. It was she who had suggested this trip after all. In for a penny, she decided wanely. In for a pound. Have it your way, she said resignedly. So they clampered up the hedge and into the cornfield, and into a strange world, not like the earth at all. The golden stubble, lit by the evening sun, stood up and rose like a blasted, colorless forest. Each separate bowl threw its own long shadow, and all the shadows, combed by the sun in the direction, lay parallel, a bizarre crisscross of light and dark, which flicked and flickered with every footstep between the bowls on the draw, straw strewn earth. Grew scarlet pimpernel in plenty, with here and there a ripened ear of wheat. Take a bit of stock, too, Pod advised them. Makes it easier to carry. The light was so strange in this broken, beetle-hunted forest that every now and again Arietti seemed to lose sight of her parents, but turning panic-stricken would find them again quite close, zebra-striped with black and gold. At last they could carry no more, and Pod had mercy. They foregathered on their own side of the hedge, each with two hunches of wheat ears, carried head downwards by a short length of stalks. Arietti was reminded of Crampferl, back home in the big house, going past the grating with onions for the kitchen. They had been strung on strings and looked like these corn grains, and in about the same proportion. Can you manage all that? asked Pod anxiously of Homily, as she started off ahead down the hill. I'd sooner carry it than grind it, remarked Homily, tartly without looking back. There wouldn't be no badger sets along this side, panted Pod, coming abreast of Arietti. Not with all the plowing, sowing, dogs, men, horses, tractors, and whatnot as there must have been. Where could one be then? asked Arietti, setting down her corn for a moment to rest her hands. We've been all around. 
There's only one place to look now, said Pod. Them trees in the middle. And standing still in the deep shadow, he gazed across the stretch of pasture land. The field looked in this light much as it had on that first day. Could that only be the day before yesterday? But from this angle, they could not see the trail of dusky shadow thrown by the island of trees. Open ground, said Pod staring. Your mother would never make it. I'd go, said Arietti. I'd like to go. Pod was silent. I gotta think, he said. After a moment, come on, lass, take up your corn, else we won't get back before dark. They didn't. Or rather, it was deep dusk along the ditch of their home stretch, and almost dark when they came abreast of their cave. But even in the half-light, there seemed something suddenly homelike and welcoming about the laced-up boot. Homily sank down at the foot of the bank, between her bunches of corn, just a breather, she explained weakly, before the next pull-up. Take your time, said Pod. I'll go ahead and unlace the boot. Panting a little, half dragging his ears of corn, he started up the bank. Arietti followed. Pod? Called Homily from the darkness below without turning. You know what? What? Asked Pod. It's been a long day, said Homily. Suppose tonight we made a nice cup of tea? Please yourself said Pod, unlacing the neck of the boot and feeling cautiously inside. He raised his voice, shouting down at her. What you have now, you can't have later. Bring the half-scissor, Arietti, will you? It's on a nail in the storeroom. After a moment, he added impatiently, Hurry up. No need to take all day. It's just there to your hand. It isn't came Arietti's voice after a moment. What do you mean it isn't? It isn't here. Everything else is, though. Isn't there? exclaimed Pod unbelievably. Wait, wait a minute. Let me look. Their voices sounded muffled to Homily, listening below. She wondered what the fuss was about. Something or someone's been mucking about in here, she heard Pod say after what seemed a distressed pause. And picking up her ears of wheat, Homily scrambled up the bank. Get a match, will ya? Pod was saying in a worried voice, and light the candle. And Homily forged in the boot to find the wax matches. As the wick guttered, wavered, then rose to a steady flame, the little hollow halfway up the bank became illuminated like a scene on a stage. Strange shadows were cast on the sandy walls of the annex. Pod and Homily and little Arietti seemed, as they passed back and forth curiously unreal, like characters in a play. There were the borrowing bags stacked neatly together as Pod had left them, their mouths tied up with twine. There hung the tools from their beam-like root, and leaning beside them, as Pod had left it this morning, the purple thistle head, which he had swept the floor. He stood there now, white-faced in the candlelight, his hand on a bare nail. It was here, he said, tapping the nail. That's where I left it. Oh, goodness, exclaimed Homily, setting down her wheat ears. Let's just look again. She pulled aside the borrowing bags and felt behind them. A and you, Arietti, she ordered, could you get round to the back of the boot? But it was not there, nor, they discovered suddenly, was a larger hat pin. Anything but them two things, Pod kept saying in a worried voice as homily, for the third or fourth time, went through the contents of the boot. The smaller hat pin's here, all right, she kept repeating. We still got one. You see, no animal could unlace a boot, but what kind of animal, said, asked Pod wearily, would take a half-nail scissor? A magpie might, suggested Arietti, if it looked kind of shiny. Maybe, 
said Pod. But what about the hat pin? I don't see a magpie carrying the two. No. He went on thoughtfully. It doesn't look to me like no magpie, nor any other race of bird, nor no animal either. If it comes to that, nor would I say it was any kind of human being. A human being, like as not, finding a hole like this smashes the whole place up. Kind of kick with their feet, human beings do, out walking. Force they touch a thing with their hands. Looks to me, said Pod, like something in the style of a borrower. Oh, cried Arietti joyfully. Then we've found them. Found what? Asked Pod. The cousin. The Hendrys. Pod was silent a moment. Maybe, he said uneasily again. Maybe? Mimicked homily, irritated. Who else could it be? They live in this field, don't they? Arietti, put some water on to boil. There's a good girl. We don't want to waste the candle. Now see here, began Pod. But we can't fix the tin lid, interrupted Arietti, without something to hold it. Oh, goodness me, exclaimed homily. Use your head and think of something. Suppose we'd never had a nail scissor. Tie a piece of twine round an aspirin lid and hang it over the flame from a nail or, or a bit of root of something. What were you saying, Pod? I said we got to go careful on the tea, that's all. We was only going to make tea to celebrate like, or in what you might call a case of grave emergency. Well... We are, aren't we? Are what? Asked Pod. Celebrating. Looks like we've found what we came for. Pod glanced uneasily towards Arietti, who, in the farther corner of the annex, was busily knotting twine round a, a ridge edge of a screw-on lid. You don't want to go so fast, Homily, he warned her. Lowering his voice, nor do you want to jump to no conclusions. Say it was one of the Hendrys. All right. Then why didn't they leave a word or sign or stay a while to wait for us? Hendry knows our gear all right. That proverb book of Arietti's say, many's the time he sent it back home under the kitchen. I don't see what you're getting at, said Homily in a puzzled voice watching Arietti anxiously as gingerly she suspended the water-filled aspirin lid from a root above the candle. Careful, she called out. You don't want to burn the twine. What I'm getting at is this, exclaimed Pod. Say you look at the nail scissor as a blade, a sword, as you might say, and the hat pin as a spear, say, or a dagger. Well, whoever took them, things has armed himself, see what I mean, and left us weaponless. We got the other hat pin, said Homily in a troubled voice. Maybe, said Pod, but he doesn't know what, see what I mean? Yes, whispered Homily, very scared. Make tea if you like, Pod went on, but I wouldn't call it a celebration. Not yet, at any rate. Homily glanced unhappily toward the candle, above the aspirin lid. She noticed longingly. Already there rose a welcome haze of steam. Well, she began and hesitated. Then suddenly she seemed to brighten. It comes to the same thing. How do you mean? asked Pod. About the tea, explained Homily, perking up. Going by what you said, stealing our weapons and such... This looks to be something you might call serious. Depends on how it strikes you, I mean. She went on hurriedly. There's some I know as might even name it as a state of grave emergency. There's some as might, agreed Pod wanely. Then suddenly he sprang aside, beating the air with his hands. Arietti screamed and homily for a second, thought they had gone mad. Then she saw... A great moth had lumbered into the alcove, attracted by the light. 
It was fawn-colored and, to homily, hideous drunk and blinded with light. Save the tea, she cried. Panic-stricken and seizing the purple thistle head, beat wildly about the air. Shadows danced every way, and in their shouting and scolding, they hardly noticed the sudden silent thickening of night swerve in on the dusk. But they felt the wind as its passing watched the candle gutter and saw the moth was gone. What was that? asked Arietti at last after an awed silence. It was an owl, said Pod. He looked thoughtful. It ate the moth? As it would eat you, said Pod. If you went mucking about after dusk, we're living and learning, he said. No more candles after dark. Up with the sun and down with the sun. That's us from now on. The water's boiling, Pod, said Homily. Put the tea in, said Pod, and douse the light. We can drink it all right in the dark. And turning away, he propped the broom handle back against the wall, and while Homily was making the tea, he tidied up the annex, stacking the ears of wheat alongside the boot, straightening the borrowing bags, and generally seeing all was ship-shaped for the night. When he had finished, he crossed to the hanging shelf and ran a loving hand along his neatly hanging row of tools. Just before they doused the light, he stood for a long time deep in thought, his hand on an empty nail. Yikes. So they've been borrowed upon. They've had something, some things taken from them whilst they were out hunting for the Henderies, thinking that they were pretty much all alone or that they could be all alone. That's kind of interesting. wonder who or what or what happened to his stuff. Anyway, go ahead and leave comments down below kind of speculating what you think is going to happen. And I want to say thank you guys so very, very much for tuning in today. And stay tuned for more chapters. And you have a wonderful and blessed day.